Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. I think we're good to go. Joe, no, we're okay? Yep, okay. Well, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to our um, the first uh, Dean's Lecture of the fall, um, or the academic year, actually. And, you know, these, these events are really, really special to me. Um, and I'm so delighted to have people here in the audience face-to-face, -face, as well as a robust uh, audience um, online. So thank you all very, very much for coming. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to recognize what brings us here today. Uh, the Dean's Lecture uh, Series provides us with the opportunity to highlight the work of our newly appointed and promoted professors and senior scientists. These lectures are a chance to hear from the, our esteemed colleagues who are leaders in their fields and who are impacting lives in very meaningful ways through their research, practice, and teaching of public health. And today is no exception, and it's a, um, a real delight to welcome Hallie Wilcox. A renowned researcher and advocate, she is a leading voice in advancing public health approaches to suicide prevention. Much of her work is focused on the mental health of young people and includes population-based research, the evaluation of community-based prevention programs, and data linkage strategies to advance youth suicide, youth suicide prevention. Her efforts span schools and universities, emergency departments, and in all of these settings and many more, she's helping us to understand and effectively implement public health-minded programs and policies that have the power to save lives. As we all know, this work is more urgent than ever before. Our nation's young people are experiencing a deep and wide-ranging um, mental health crisis, one that has, of course, been exacerbated by the pandemic. In the United States, suicide is a leading, the second leading cause of death among 10 to 14 year olds, and the third leading cause of death among adolescents and young adults. The fact that so many young people are in this uh, pain is, is devastating to all of us, as is the heartbreak experienced by their loved ones. But as Dr. Wilcox will tell us today, solutions are not out of reach. Public health has powerful tools to offer, and our efforts in this area are continuing to grow. Today, we'll hear more about Dr. Wilcox's impressive work, as well as her, pl as well as her plans for scaling up the Bloomberg School's impact in this area. I think both will give you uh, reasons uh, to feel hopeful. Now, when people think about suicide prevention, they often think about what's done at the point of crisis such as prevention hotlines. But Holly and her colleagues are focused much further upstream, examining how we can uh, help people from ever having, having reached that um, uh, crisis moment to begin with. She has studied the effectiveness of teaching depression, literacy, in schools. She has worked to implement suicide screening, risk screening in pediatric emergency departments, and she is helping schools and communities to understand new laws such as the Stand Up Act and Safer Communities Act, so that the full promise of legislation like this can be realized. And these are just a few examples of her amazing work. We will hear more about this in her presentation. Dr. Wilcox is a professor of the Department of Mental Health with a joint appointment in Health Policy and Management, as well as joint appointments in the School of Medicine, as well as the School of Education. She also runs the University Suicide Prevention Research Group, bringing together experts from across Johns Hopkins to pursue multidisciplinary projects and serve as a source of um, expertise. And just this past month, the group was selected the winner of the annual Team Science Award from the Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. This is a wonderful testament to Dr. Wilcox's leadership as well as the importance of the work that this group is doing. Dr. Wilcox's expertise is valued and dependent, depended upon by many, many folks. She is chair of the research uh, grant committee on the, um, the committee on the American, sorry, Foundation of Suicide Prevention, helping to ensure that the gifts often coming from uh, grieving families support meaningful and strategic work. She is also the incoming president elected by her peers of the International Academy of Suicide Research. And closer to home, Holly was appointed by the governor of Maryland 
to the school board and uh, the State Commission on Suicide Prevention. In addition to all of this, Dr. Will Cox is a celebrated teacher and mentor, having won the Bloomberg School's Amateur Awards three times. She is committed to engaging students and recruiting them into this promising field with a particular goal of helping develop a diverse workforce for the future. I know we often uh, use the uh, term that uh, 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 faculty here at the School of Public Health are restless when we talk about their work. And Dr. Wilcox uh, colleagues tell me that in her case, um, it is certainly not a cliche. In fact, throughout the pandemic, coworkers have often turned to Holly because they were worried about their own children. She has always, she has always been there as a resource and as a friend, providing expertise and compassion in their time of need. Losing a child to suicide is unthinkable, unthinkable and a tragedy that no one wants to face. We are so grateful for Dr. Wilcox and all that she has done to advance public health approaches to prevention. Her work continues to help young people out of darkness and save lives. Dr. Wilcox, it is a huge honor to um, invite you to the podium and give your talk. We're very much looking forward to it. Um, Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I, I want to thank Dean McKenzie for that very kind and generous introduction. And I also want to thank Becky Newcomer for her um, all her help and, and logistics and, and getting this set up and really appreciate it. Um, so here are my disclosures. I, I would like to also thank um, the agencies that have funded our research and they're listed here. Um, so today in the time that I have, um, what I'd like to do is to give you the landscape and the context of this major public health problem, um, suicide that is, uh, talk about some barriers to success, the urgent need for a, more of a public health approach to this issue, as well as improvements in clinical care, um, and current initiatives, and I'm just gonna mention some current initiatives and opportunities for impacts. So I'm gonna start today by emphasizing for all of you that even though I'm, I'm showing data and statistics, each one of these data points represents a person and someone we've lost to suicide. And it's important to note that this is one of the most traumatic, intensely traumatic experiences anyone can have in losing a family member to suicide. Um, so, and, and people who we lose to suicide leave behind their families, their classmates, um, their work colleagues, and it has a ripple effect in neighborhoods and communities and a multi-generational impact. Also, I, I would like to start by talking about um, suicide as one of the 10 leading causes of death. Um, it used to be within the 10 leading causes of death overall, and, and now it's the 12th the, um, due to the pandemic and the COVID-related deaths. But here you can see that among young people who are typically healthy, um, it is the second or, or third leading cause of death. And in very young people, which is a trend that's somewhat new, this five to nine-year-old group, the 10th leading cause of death, it, it popped up as. And um, so it is the second leading cause of death globally in 15 to 24-year-olds. Um, the CDC just released the 2021 data um, showing that 57, uh, four, I'm sorry, 47,646 people died in 2021 of suicide. However, this is a real underestimate and we don't know what the real um, number of suicides we experience in the United States is, but we do know that due to death classification procedures and limited information at the at the time of the death, um, this is an underestimate of the real magnitude of suicide 
And as I said, if you think about the family members and those left behind and the impacts it has, it is a major public health problem. And so thinking about the rates over time and the trends in suicide, um, since about the year 2000, 2002, we've had a national suicide prevention strategy. And often what this is, is when a government is, you know, interested in a topic, focused on a topic, there's a strategy that takes place that, that where people come together to, to come up with a way forward to reduce the, the um, this specific outcome of focus. And so we have had one for quite some time and it was revised in 2012. And as you can see here, the, the suicide rates have been somewhat flat or increasing in some groups. And this slide shows that those who are younger, the 15 through 24 year old group and the 25 through 34 year old group show trend upward um, at the most recent data points. Um, and the older groups haven't had as much of an increase. However, one thing that we do know about the suicide data is when we look at overall rate, oftentimes um, what's masked is different subgroup variation. And Dr. John Campo is relatively new to Hopkins. He's been here just a few years ago as the division director of child and adolescent psychiatry. And he and his um, team prior to coming to Hopkins have really done a lot of work looking at disparities based on race, ethnicity, and age in suicide. And, and they do exist. And we'll, we'll dive into that in a, in a minute. But these are what the suicide rates look like. And an even more complicated picture here, and this shows you where I'm going with this masking issues. Here you can see the trends that are, this is the self-injury rate, whereas I was just showing you the suicide rate in the prior slide. So self-injury rate that was treated in a hospital. And the, these are data from the National Elect Electronic Injury Surveillance System. So here you can show, like if you just look at the overall, you don't really see the full picture, but if you look at some specific subgroups, you can see the increase. And, and this is just getting rid of all the adults data and <laughs> looking at, at kids specifically by age. Um, and so here you can see the trends that we're experiencing in the United States. And some have been wondering what's going on here and what is causing them. And of course, the things that come to mind are the financial crisis of um, 2008 as one possibility that's hard to really tease out. Another is the, the social media, um, iPhones, and all those other things that can impact young people. And I'll get back to that in a second. But within this context of these rising suicide rates that we're seeing in um, young people, um, our overall suicide rate has kind of increased up until about 2018, where it kind of hit a peak. And then it went down about 5%, went up 35% to 2018. And then it went down around 5% over the next two years. So 2020, I mean, 2019 and 2020, and then went back up according to the CDC with the data that's about to re be released for 2021, went back up 4%. And so um, within this context of examining suicide, the other thing we've been experiencing nationwide is a more general um, crisis in children's mental health. And Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, has written a report that's really nicely done, kind of laying out what the evidence base is. Prior to the pandemic, we were all trending upward. A lot of mental health outcomes like depression, anxiety, and suicide-related thoughts and behaviors were increasing. And then the pandemic hit, and it's really ringing the alarm for um, doing something, take, getting more of a proactive approach within schools and other child-serving systems. And at about the time when Vivek Murthy's report came out, um, there were also some groups that are child serving groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the um, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the um, Children's Hospital Association declaring national emergency in, in child and adolescent. And so um, 
what I want to do is talk a little bit about those issues that I just mentioned, because we really don't know for sure with aggregate data, it's really hard to sort out um, different causal factors or things that may be um, going on with these data. And so one of my um, colleagues in the UK did a national study where he looked, David Gunnell um, and his group, what they did is they looked at multiple countries and the data in those countries. And what they were trying to get at is um, whether there was an impact of the 2008 economic recession in terms of the impact of changes in GDP, um, whether there was a Gini index income inequality within settings, within countries driving this impact, or was it daily number of hours on social media? So really complicated project. They looked at a number of countries. What they wound up doing is really focusing on the high income countries that had over 20,000, I mean, 20 million people um, living there. And they, they did a very complicated analysis. And then they wound up seeing that of those countries that are high income and have over 20 million occupants, they found that four countries had an increase in youth suicide rates. It was Canada, the United States, Australia, and the UK. And so they did a deep dive in those countries to try to see what was going on. And there was no evidence or no consistent, let me say, there was no consistent evidence of a role for the 2008 economic recession impact or no consistent evidence of social media, but there was what appeared to be a pretty consistent impact of income inequality and the role that that's playing um, in terms of young people ages 15 through 24. The other thing that's worth mentioning to all of you as we talk about suicide, it's hard to talk about suicide without some other topics like guns and like depression and alcohol because depression and alcohol are probably two of the most um, modifiable risk factors for suicide across multiple studies and contexts. Um, and this slide um, shows you that it's almost very similar to this next one, oh, whoops, this one, and that this looks at males and females. The top bar um, is represented by females and the bottom bar is represented in, as males. And you see a consistent trend here, the top bar represented by females and the, the, the bottom one is, is males. And here you can see almost the same type of pattern that teenage depression is increasing, especially among girls. And this data reflects having at least one major depressive episode with severe impairment in the past year among um, 12 through 17 year olds. And these are data from the NUSDA, um, so the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, and they show you a, a very similar pattern. The interesting thing about these data, you see this increase that's happening over time, but there isn't a parallel increase in these young people getting help and getting mental health related services as a result of these increasing trends in depression. And that's one thing that we're confronted with just about every day is like, how can we better capture and engage young people in general or, or, or adults even in the range of intervention approaches that we know work through research evidence. So to confront this issue um, in a way that's more strategic, we got together a group, some of whom are here and many of whom are um, on Zoom, but this is a group of people that we have um, that meets every couple weeks and we talk about grants and projects and how to make impact and just uh, you name it, things come up all the time. And the last conversation that we had, which was last week was an interesting one. So I wanna to tell you a little bit about this. So here you can see all of our team members. And the idea is that we have students represented, we have people from across the university. It's a very much an interdisciplinary team. And we did, um, as Dean McKenzie said, we won this ICPR Team Science 
award, which is kind of a fun thing to win. And, and they say that we have bragging rights for a year. <laughs> we have this, we get a nice coffee party, you know, coffee break and um, other things that are kind of fun. But the, the last topic of conversation we had with the group was initiated by our colleague, Lanny Berman, who's part of our group. And he was taking a step back as a senior person and looking at what we see are these increasing rates. And, and here in this figure, you'll see the suicide rate in the United States on the left, and you'll see the suicide rate in Denmark on the right. And you have to figure that these two countries are very different. You know, like 330 million people in the United States and around 6 million people in Denmark, which is around the size of Maryland, kind of similar. And so these are two different contexts, but what we've been seeing in, in, in our country and in, in a few other countries as well is this trending upward, despite having a national strategy and having um, you know, people working in this area and very dedicated like myself. And then you see other settings where you, you see kind of a decrease. And so the whole issue came up of, you know, are we, are we making an impact? It doesn't appear that we're making an impact. Should we be doing something different? And in terms of our national suicide prevention strategy, and, and many other countries have one, not all countries have one, but these are some common and, and components of a national um, strategy. So you can see where they're coming from. And the issue that we thought that, you know, we have this strategy and we've had it for a long time, but we don't seem to be making an impact. What it boils down to and what we've talked about, we think is, it could be a number of factors, we don't know for sure, but implementation. And this is a real, I think, a sweet spot for public health. You know, if we know that interventions work and we know that some research is promising, you know, in, in one way, one role for public health is to be the translator and to be the group that gets it out there into the field and gets people using these approaches. So we know in the United States that efforts are very fragmented. There's no scaling, there's no real sustainment. You know, sometimes people apply for grants, they have this great program, it comes in. Um, there's a champion who's really excited about the program and then the champion leaves and everything, you know, or the grant, the money dries up from the grant and, and it's gone. And so there's this whole issue in the United States with um, that type of thing happening. And it's not just here, it's in other places too. There's also the lack of coordination, planning and synchronization of approaches, kind of all, the way things work a lot is states do what they want. I mean, the United States is a very heterogeneous place with lots of different subpopulations and risk groups. And not a one size fit all approach isn't gonna work. And so there has to be some advanced planning, coordination, synchronization. And then this idea that I think is best is why don't we just have people do suicide prevention as part of their job? So if you work in a school, it would be ideal to be trained if you're a teacher or if you're other type of professional, to be able to identify people at risk and to know what to do and to be able to deliver programming that's evidence-based. Or if you work in a healthcare setting, it would be ideal for you to be trained to know what to say to somebody who's at risk and how to motivate them and encourage them to make it to their appointment in the, in the community. And so this whole workforce development and community capability is, I think, the direction we need to go in. It's just hard to get people to introduce something new into their already, most of the time, very busy job. And then the other issue is, if people are doing some kind of a program that's a comprehensive suicide prevention program or whatever, multi-pronged approach, those we know that those are the best way to approach this issue, oftentimes it's great to have data to let people know what they're doing and the time that they're investing in this is actually working. And oftentimes there isn't that feedback loop of you know having data, doing quality improvement, quality um, assessment, and then getting the data back to the healthcare providers and the other people so that they know 
that the resources they're investing in and the man and woman power is paying off. So that's another major challenge that we face is in getting data and getting it, you know, producing the evidence to get it back, a feedback loop type of process. And also limited resources. Um, now we're in the, we had the launch of 988 this mm -hmm. year, the, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And it was a big effort and an extremely expensive effort. Mm -hmm. The last estimate that I heard from the federal government was over $400 million. And it would be ideal to have a similar, you know, type of an investment that's going to be ongoing for a more upstream public health approach. Also, part of one of the issues that Lanny mentioned um, when we had this call with our group and we were talking about the national strategy and how it doesn't appear to be working and what needs to be done to move forward is this idea of leadership. And, and of course, including people that have lived experience, they're often not at the table as decision makers. And that is an important um, omission. But the question also came up of, okay, it doesn't appear to be working, but we, are we actually making things worse for some people in the United States by trying to implement this strategy? And if we didn't have this strategy, could the rates be much higher? And so we, of course, we don't know, you know, it's a, just a philosophical conversation, but I thought it was interesting. And there actually have been some groups that have studied countries that have strategic plans and then have looked, given a little lag, because it takes a while to get things implemented, and then have looked to see if there was a corresponding reduction in suicide. And the the evidence is really inconsistent, almost null, that these strategic plans have an impact on um, suicide-related outcomes. And, you know, there's a lot of limitations, and I can couch it that way, but um, even when people have looked at each strategic objective in relation to suicide, they haven't found much. Um, it's very inconsistent, at least in the field. But the one thing that we do know is in the United States and many other settings, there is much more of an investment in crisis services and in, in indicated and selective approaches. And people don't seem to quite know what to do in the universal space, or there just hasn't been enough of an investment in that space. So the circular figure is from Shep Kellum who I've worked with for a long time. And I prefer it slightly to the Institute of Medicine figure, this pyramid, because you know, everything is kind of within each other. You know, this indicated and selective is within the, the universal interventions approach. Because within most universal approaches, sometimes it can be easier to identify people at risk within the context of the universal intervention. And I prefer it. So in, the, in terms of suicide, a universal approach would be one that is just to the entire population. Selective would be groups at risk for suicide. And indicated are the people who are experiencing ideation and, and have attempted. So this is what we see in this field of suicide prevention, a real focus on identifying and treating people at high risk. And this is where we need to go thinking about moving the entire population's risk to a lower state. How do I think we can get there? Well, I worked with the Bloomberg American Health Initiative folks um, in the violence um, group. And we have a paper that was led by Michelle Decker and Sharvan Holloway and um, Daniel Webster were also co-authors. This is in the special issue of public health reports. And one thing when we were working on this together, we all are focused on different aspects of violence. I'm self-directed, Daniel's you know, community or um, violence and Michelle Decker is a gender-based violence um, uh, expert. And one thing we were realizing is that a lot of the predictors and risk factors and protective factors overlap 
between the different types, people who experience the different types of violence. And another thing we notice is the strategies and the responses to deal with these different types of violence. A lot of these strategies work on multiple, across multiple um, outcomes, not just suicide, but suicide and gender-based violence. And it was interesting to kind of dig into this. And one example of this, this is my favorite example, is a good behavior game, which has been um, worked on here for decades with Nick Iolongo and, and um, Seth Callum and, and a big group of people. But that has had, has shown impacts on violent crime and, and suicide related behavior and so forth. So taking a step back and thinking about, well, these approaches that impact multiple outcomes should be prioritized potentially over, over, over different programs and, and evident, you know, that have evidence on only one outcome. And that makes us think of, you know, the next thing I wanted to talk about is, is other examples of what role public health can play. And here's another data point. I mentioned guns earlier. And when we look at the um, NICS um, FBI database for people who went in to have a firearm background check, check over time, what we're noticing is in the past few years, since the beginning of the pandemic, there have been more um, firearm background checks. And these are a proxy. This is some, somewhat of a proxy for the availability of firearms on the street. And so what we're seeing is a frightening trend that there's more availability of firearms in the community. And we all know from multiple huge evidence base that the increased availability of firearms is a big factor linked with suicide and other outcomes. And so this is something for us to be thinking and strategizing about. The other thing I wanted to point out is I wanted to show you a couple of figures. And this really, I think, I like the way this illustrates the impact of firearm policies. If you look at the figure on the left, those are our suicide rates. So the darker the color, the higher the rate in the various states. And here in this figure that's on the right side, the darker the color, the, the, more, the more strict firearm laws they have are a better score. You know, the um, Gifford, um, Gabby Gifford's group has this grading system for um, firearm laws, and, and they have the scorecard for it. So the countries that have been in are California, New Jersey, and others. And you can see where the states fall in terms of their grade for on the, the firearm, uh, the gun law uh, scorecard. So you can see that there's consistency between the two and there's just a lot of evidence that's out there that it makes a lot of sense. And so the work that Shannon Frederoli is doing and with Paul Nestad and others on extremist protective order um, legislation implementation makes a lot of practical sense. And it's, also wanted to highlight the great work of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Policy Solutions, of course. Um, the, the other strategy that we've taken is one that has to do with data. And this is, you know, this is kind of in our wheelhouse in public health. Data and surveillance systems and all that is of real interest to us. So back a few years ago, uh, Dr. Hadi Karazi, who is in um, the Department of Health Policy and Management, and I and others teamed up to get a, a grant to try to create a suicide warehouse in the state of Maryland, where rather than the data sitting in silos, let's combine it all into one place. And the advantage that we have is CRIS, which is our health information exchange, is very advanced in our region. And so they see they they serve as the honest data broker that takes the uh, identified data from maybe twelve sources, including um, different healthcare systems and other places, and they link these data together. Even the VA system is part of this data warehouse, and if they put it all into one um, data set and they give it back to us in a de-identified way. And the idea is 
that we can use it for predictive analytics. We can look at, at it to figure out like what data points are most important in, in, in predicting suicide. Like, is it the, a certain type of claims data? Or, um, and so there's a lot that we can do with this in trying to do things such as, which system did somebody touch last before they died by suicide? Should we be partnering with pain management doctors? Should we be thinking more about, you know, partnering with other types of, there's, so there's a lot of things that this type of a data integrated data warehouse um, can do. And so we've been working um, to do that. And it also provides a, an opportunity for evaluation. If we're rolling out new initiatives, we can look potentially to see if it has an impact according to suicide mortality and morbidity and the state of mind. The other, one of the other initiatives that we've been involved in recently is thinking about legislation. And if there's legislation, the important thing is the ability to be able to implement it with high quality. And the Stand Up Act is a piece of legislation that's suicide focused and involves implementing peer to peer programs in schools for students in grades six through 12. And a lot of times schools have no idea how to select programs, but they wanna get the funding and they wanna do the right thing and they wanna be able to give, you know, bring resources to their students. So we've been working um, with a group, um, one colleague from NAMI Montana, the executive director of uh, NAMI Montana, and one of our former MPH students um, who is now a, um, a practicing pediatrician, um, teamed up with me to put together some guidance for schools on how to select evidence-based programs and the price, the costs, and the, you know, all the pieces of information they need to know about training. And, and, and so we, we're trying to think through how to, to, to get this information out to schools. Another possibility, uh, another kind of thing that this happened in the field that we kind of have been trying to leverage is the idea that the Joint Commission really wants to have um, these patient safety goals met. So that's another issue is it's hard for healthcare systems to figure out, oh, which screen should I use? And is there an evidence base on the screen? And you know, how do I, what's the protocol for if we introduce the screening and somebody's positive, what should ha happen next? And so our group has been working a lot with our pediatric emergency department, Tish Ryan and um, Mitchell Goldstein and others on how to, I've been working with them for now over for over 10 years, thinking about how to introduce screening that what at first was it was selective screening and then switched to universal screening and then trying to build from that screening because just identifying somebody as at risk for suicide and not being able to do anything else for them, you know, provides somewhat of a, an ethical dilemma. And so trying to enhance the standard of care um, for young people in our um, pediatric emergency department and, and trying to embed these approaches. And we have a number of people in our group have been working along this chain of care on different interventions and, and how to improve the standard of care in young people. And we've been doing something kind of similar with our students um, across Johns Hopkins. We've been trying to get this more of a multi-tiered approach to identifying students at risk and what types of expanding the, the, the services that we're um, able to offer um, as a university to, to students. And one of the most exciting developments for our team is this possibility of being able to serve in some role as a research partner with EPIC. Um, so EPIC right now has a few different priorities and, and EPIC is the um, health system, you know, health software for um, in, in different hospitals. And they're a health, healthcare software company. And so this idea of being able to partner with them um, is exciting because they're really focused on suicide prevention, opioid addiction, and sepsis right now. And we can't help with addiction and too much in sepsis, but we can help out with thinking about ways to use the infrastructure that Epic has 
with their software, and I think their software serves about 70% of people in the United States have records within the EPIC system. So ideally, with their infrastructure, we would be able to roll out some of the best practices um, with their, they've developed a toolkit that has suicide risk screening in it, risk stratification, risk assessment, safety planning, and some of these things that are um, the low hanging fruit in the field in terms of interventions and don't require a great deal of time from providers, but can make a big difference. And of course, one that's really of interest is lethal means safety and how to do that and do it well. Because uh, it can be a conversation where somebody completely shuts you down or they engage with you. And so we're thinking through ways to be able to facilitate a research partnership with EPIC to try to get healthcare systems throughout the United States to um, scale up these best practices as part of their software. And lastly, my last slide, um, one other initiative that we've been working on is thinking about the responsible reporting of suicide. There's a huge literature showing that there's a link between sensationalized um, media reporting and irresponsible media reporting and high, of high profile suicides um, in the, as a possible catalyst uh, to subsequent suicides uh, at the population level. So we have a Bloomberg fellow, Anari Patani, who you can see by her poster. We were at a conference recently this summer together. We had developed um, this course that's on Coursera. It's a MOOC, so it's a massive open online course. Uh, Bill Eaton, who's, who's here watching today, you can see him on Hollywood Squares over there, was also mm -hmm. central. It was his idea um, 10 years ago, I believe. To, to pursue this because it's such a public health oriented idea. And it took funding from the Bloomberg American Health Initiative. And it took Amiri, who is a practicing journalist, um, who's here as a fellow to help make that happen. So this course is available for free online. Last time I checked, it was just released this spring and about 500 journalists have taken the course. It's, and it's a very practical, like there are guidelines out there for journalists. But actually, how to, you know, we're translating that. How do you take the guidelines and actually do this in practice? And that, and that was a role that we were, fill, were filling in this space and also trying to um, encourage them and get them excited about implementing <laughs> these aspects of um, responsible reporting. That was part of the agenda as well. And so with that, I will stop here and, and say thank you so much for your attention. Few minutes for questions. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll start by answering a question. Um, given the um, increased uh, attention um, on, on mental health uh, these days, especially coming out of the pandemic, do you see that as impacting resources that are available? You mentioned resources are part of the problem um, in terms of um, not just research, but also. Um, uh, scaling up programmatic efforts and keeping them sustained. Are you hopeful? That yeah, I think so. I mean, one of the silver linings of the pandemic was I, I thought that maybe we could build more momentum in this area to be able to scale up or to implement a more public health approach to mental health and suicide prevention. Um, but it's, yeah, it's to be determined, you know, how that happens. So if you, um, Elizabeth, but if you have questions, um, either raise your hand, we'll try to see your hand or type your message uh, to Becky Newcomer. And microphones. The microphone. Oh, oh, it's not working. Like this, please. Yes. So if you type your, if you're online, type your message to uh, Becky Newcomer and she'll make sure that we get that question um, raised. So Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, lovely presentation, Holly. And I can't even begin to tell you how proud your colleagues in mental health are of your work and your team's work. Um, I'm 
was really focused on that the need for universal prevention programming and and in our work we just learned from some research that we're doing that medicaid expansion we just found is associated with reduced youth robbery uh, convictions and youth robbery charges of children we think it's because of the financial the positive financial impact on families that medicaid expansion has um, and I wonder if anyone has looked at the impact of Medicaid expansion on suicide and, and particularly suicide among um, children as well as among adults. Thank you for that question. That's a great question. And it's has Medicaid expansion been looked at in relation to reducing suicide related outcome. And I haven't seen it for sure, but this idea of thinking about housing and thinking about social determinants of health, and that's all part of that universal intervention approach. And so I, I think that's where we need to get is to be thinking about how expanding healthcare and um, doing other things to better support families of young children and how that can potentially translate to multiple positive outcomes. I think that's the direction that we need to head in. Yeah. They should talk. <laughs> Okay, it looks like we have a question from Maya. Um, Rocky Moore, come, um, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, why, don't, why don't you, Maya, if you would just unmute yourself and ask the question directly. So thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. And um, unfortunately, of course, the subject matter is somber, but I wanted to know, does the military's effort, um, you know, to stem suicide among soldiers, provide any guidance about what works well? Um, and is there any potential to partner uh, with the military on legislative and programmatic efforts? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I've worked in the past with the Marine Corps, um, and I know the approach that they took, which was what, what the Marines used to call um, death by PowerPoint. I'm sorry, death yeah. by PowerPoint. It was like a suicide prevention training for three hours. Um, and they've tried to change that up a bit. In, in the slide that I showed you from the public health report study, you know, showing like the common risk factors for multiple outcomes. And my understanding that the approach to training now, to leadership training within the military is to take that exact approach. There are these ideological factors, potential risk factors. They have different outcomes, but, um, and, and kind of, thinking through ways to uh, a kind of, rather than a specific siloed training, having a kind of multi-pronged training on multiple causal factors across multiple outcomes. I think that's right, but you can correct me, Maya, if I'm wrong, but I, I would love to have the opportunity to talk with you some more about this issue. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Maya. Any questions here in the room? If not, we'll go to Janet Holbrook. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, so what has been the impact of the opioid epidemic on suicide rates? Um, and are there any good estimates or any good way to estimate how many of those opioid overdoses are actually suicides and not accidental overdoses? That is, the, that is one of the key and most pressing issues that, that we're facing right now in the field. And actually my colleague who's online, um, Dr. Paul Nestat, is focusing his early career development award on that area. So just to tell you what the approach is that we're, you know, I showed you our team and the things we're doing. One of the things that he's leading up is psychological autopsy interviews. So there's a team of clinicians that we have that, that are at Hopkins that um, the medical examiner is sending letters out to family who had, families who had a recent opioid overdose loss or, or suicide loss or undetermined because in, in the state of Maryland, there's a lot of um, deaths where it's really inconclusive if it's a suicide or an overdose, it's really unclear with what was there available for the medical examiner's team, at the invest, you know, the investigators. And so he's interviewing families of people we lost to those types of deaths and trying to look more carefully at the short-term risk factors as well as some of the longer-term risk factors. What was going on with that individual in the hours, the days before their death? And just listening to the family's perspective on a number of issues um, and also providing an opportunity to get them help if, if there seems to be a need to do that. 
So these psych autopsy interviews are one, just one of the things he's doing. And then he's doing a lot of analysis of data from the medical examiner's office um, with some very sophisticated techniques that, you know, he's blind to the, what the death was and then trying to figure out if, you know, using the data and he could probably explain it much better than I am, but it's a very interesting approach to analyzing and, and, and seeing what we can learn through data. Thank you for that question. And Janet Holbrook, who's online, if you'd like to unmute and ask a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned that a risk factor or maybe a ca causal factor is increases in income disparity. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on the recent data about pretty dramatic reductions in childhood poverty in the U.S. and how you incorporate that information into your thinking. Well, I, you know, I thank you for that question. I, I think that, you know, the results that I saw that I described from that one kind of analysis across several countries, I don't think they really dug much into this issue. I think that's kind of the next step. I mean, what we've been seeing through the pandemic, at least in terms of suicide, is that among white people, the rates seem to be going down, and especially among white adults. But among other groups, their rates are not going down. And so I think we really need to figure out what's going on. And I think um, a, a, there are probably a variety of approaches that we could take, including interviews, analysis, um, and do, you know more attention to this area. It's still kind of early. Um, in this phase of the pandemic. And as we continue on, we'll learn more. Like some of these data, if they're multiple years showing the same results, but it's, there's more, it's more robust. And so as we, we move forward, we'll learn more. Um, uh, but it, it's a fascinating question and area. I wish I had a better answer, but there's clearly more research needed to sort that all out. Great. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, let me. So we have a class coming in here at twelve of uh, at uh, five o'clock. So unfortunately, we're going to have to end. However, we're going to have a reception by the Wall of Wonder and the gallery. So please um, come join us there, and you can ask some additional questions. I know there were a couple of additional questions online, but we'll get those to Holly. And we'll make sure um, she has an opportunity to answer those. But please um, join me in thanking Holly Wilcox, Professor. <laughs> Just to thank her for this is not an easy subject to 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 work on, and so we really want to applaud her. Um, persistence and her um, commitment uh, to addressing this incredibly important problem. So keep up the good work and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more at a later date. So thanks.